Hi everyone, um, so like they said, my name is Alicia Vogel. I'm a full stack developer who works at Yardstick just down the street. Uh, I work on their high stakes exam delivery software, but before I moved on to that team, I worked in their e-learning department. And one of the first projects I ever worked on was using 3JS. Because basically a client wanted a 3D simulation that was interactive in the web browser, and nobody on the team knew what the heck was gonna go on. <laughs> So uh, I, I went in kind of knowing a little bit about 3, 3JS, I felt a little bit iffy about my JavaScript skills, and over the span of two weeks I built a game engine with it. So it's a, it's a lot of fun to use, there's so much you can do with it, and there's so many different extensions and plugins that you can add on to it uh, to just have fun and make cool experiences, so let's talk about that. <laughs> so. Let's maybe just go over an overview to begin. So 3D animation is hard, <laughs> especially for us developers. We don't know what we're doing unless you do know what you're doing. Has anybody here played around with Blender before? A couple people. Who here has played around with Unity 3D or Unreal Engine? Awesome. OK, so there's a few people. So you know what I'm talking about. It's like really hard. This is uh, some actual WebGL code I just snuck off the uh, internet. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of work that goes on here, and 3JS takes care of that for us, uh, for the most part. <laughs> so 3JS is an open source, easy to use, and lightweight JavaScript library that provides Canvas 2D, SVG, CSS 3D, and WebGL renders. What that means is that if you're going for a super cool 3D animation, and you have somebody that you're anticipating is going to use a device or browser that's incompatible with WebGL, so you can have some backup options and still kind of give them a really cool interaction. So this library makes it possible to export 3D meshes from programs like Blender or build them yourself. You can build objects with 3JS. Uh, and then you can render them in the browser with just plain old JavaScript. So super cool, uh, fun times. And it's supported with most, it's supported by most browsers from Internet Explorer to Chrome. So uh, one thing I wanted to add to this, because I'm going to be going over that project I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, sometimes you might have to sacrifice some of the coolness to kind of um, deal with Internet Explorer 10's uh, limitations, as I found out. So I had a super cool high-res thing of boats and stuff, and then I had to end up basically chopping down all the faces and vertices of my 3D models until I ended up with something that looked like Mario from Nintendo 64. So <laughs> it was really sad. <laughs> so what, let's go over some basics of 3D animation, especially when it comes to 3GS. So first we have the scene. So this is the stage where every object is going to be added. Uh, and this is basically like your world. So um, whether or not there's cameras and stuff, you've got like your world, you've got things in it. And uh, when we add a camera, that kind of acts like an eye into that world. So um, when you as a user are, are looking at this um, 3JS app, uh, the scene is what you're looking into, but the camera is what, going, what is going to act like your eyes into the screen, even though uh, you know, your, your eyes are square, usually, <laughs> when it comes to these cameras. So then we have lights. Lights are really important because they allow us to actually let us see what we're trying to look at. Um, in the example I'm going to go over, we're not going to add any lights, uh, and something will still show up, but you'll notice that you can't, there's no detail, there's really nothing. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, and there's many different types of lights as well. There's like the atmosphere lights, there's like uh, spotlights and stuff, and so you need to have the right balance of those things in order to end up with a really great end result. Um, then we have the renderer. So this is what is going to display the scene. This is what's going to animate the scene. This is where all our logic is going to take place. But behind the scenes, the stuff that we don't see, uh, this is the part of 3JS that takes care of all the WebGL stuff that we don't care about. So, yay. Uh, and then we have objects. And these are the cool things that we're going to be putting into our scene that our camera is going to look at and that our light is going to illuminate. So um, these objects could be planes, so just like a 2D square or rectangle. Uh, these could be um, just boxes and cylinders and uh, like 
its ears and stuff, or it could be something as magnificent as a cat. Like, there's really uh, so many possibilities. So we've got an example here of what that kind of looks like. So we've got a, a cylinder. So this is actually from a tutorial where you, you build a game. Uh, you build a game where um, you have a little plane and you've got like this world uh, that is spinning underneath. And this plane is trying to dodge clouds and stuff. So this is kind of um, showing what that will look like in terms of what you're going to be building with 3JS. So we've got a light source at the top right. We've got our little plane object, and we've got our mesh for the cylinder. And then we have our camera pointed at that, and everything is contained within the scene. So everything we want to include in the scene, what, from the camera to the objects to the lights, we have to make sure that the scene knows about them, or else it's not going to render. So adding 3JS to a, to a project is really, really simple. All you got to do is download the minified library from GitHub or from their official website, or you can import it as a module if you, if you like to use Gulp or NPM. Uh, include it in your HTML like you would with any other J JavaScript file, and then you're done. You can just start writing some 3JS stuff. So uh, yeah, it's almost too simple. Um, so what does 3JS look like? Because I've talked about how amazing it is, um, but you know, is it going to be really easy to read? Uh, what are we dealing with here? So this is the, just the most basic example taken straight out of their documentation that I'll be looking at and playing around with a bit today. So um, hopefully this is big enough on the screen. <laughs> but this is all the HTML you need, basically. Um, you just need uh, a body and you need to include your JavaScript. So uh, we've got some styling for the canvas, and we don't, you might notice that there isn't a canvas object, like there's no div with a class of canvas, nothing. And that's because our render is actually going to create a canvas for us, which is kind of neat. Um, and then, yeah, there's no other HTML elements to really worry about unless you want to add some UI components uh, and stuff, because this is JavaScript, right? It's not just contained to what's going on in the canvas, what's being rendered by the WebGL. You can, you know, have interactions where you click on a button and then something happens within the anim animating stuff. So here's what the JavaScript starts to look like. So he here's the first little bit. So um, to display anything with 3GS, we need three things for sure every single time. We need a scene, we need a camera, and we need a renderer. So in addition to creating the renderer instance, uh, we need to set the size. We want to render our app. So this is usually the height and width of whatever we're trying to fill. Uh, and then we add the render instance to our HTML document, because obviously our, our HTML document needs to display it somehow and know that it exists. Um, so let's come back to the cameras here for a sec, because that's probably the most complicated bit of this first part. Um, so here's that line again. So there's a couple of different camera types. Um, there's orthogonal, stereo, perspective. Hopefully this means something to you. Uh, but all this information is in the documentation. Uh, with the orthogonal camera, it just kind of comes along with some neat camera controls, so you can kind of um, rotate the camera around an axis and stuff, which makes it nice for when you're building your project and you're trying to look at how it looks in the scene. Um, so there's a couple of different attributes here for this method. So we've got field of view, which is the very first one, the 75. Uh, and this is the extent of the scene that is seen on the display at any given moment. So you can make it really wide, you can make it really small. You've, if you play video games, you might have played around with this a little bit on stuff like Overwatch. You can change your field of view. Um, then you've got your aspect ratio. So this is the width of the element divided by its height. So you might be familiar with stuff like 4, 3, 16, 9 when you're like buying a TV or you know watching a YouTube video and you're trying to select what kind of aspect ratio you want. So you get to control this here too. And if you goof this up, your image will squish and look really dumb, as I found out. Um, so then we have something called the near and far clipping plane. These are the last two attributes here. So basically, um, there's, there are no like units when it comes to distance within the 3D world. Um, as far as 3GS cares, uh, so basically, like zero is basically like right on the exact middle point or whatever, and then we can kind of decide how we want to scale whether you know every face of our objects is like 10 units wide or one, whatever. So um, I don't know if this is making any sense. But basically, <laughs> um, if anything that's closer than what you've selected for your near clipping uh, plane, uh, they're not going to appear on the camera. So this is kind of nice when you're trying to do from the perspective of the player or something in a video game. 
um, and you might be like running to things and see their hands and stuff. What if someone runs into you? When do they disappear? Or when, when might like your hands go out of frame or you know, if you touch your face, do you keep seeing your hand or does it go through your head? You know, like you can kind of decide those things. It's whatever you want. And then of course we have the far clipping plane. So um, in terms of CPU usage um, and, and GPU usage, uh, you want to probably not make this a million billion units long or else, um, you know, if you have a super huge scene, like a, in an amazing open world 3GS project, I have no idea what you guys might try. Um, it's going to really slow things down a, a lot. <laughs> so you want to keep this number fairly low because you don't want to see every detail of every mountain that is 3,000 units away, maybe. You might only want to see 300 units away. And then you can progressively render those things as you get closer to them. So um, now in this project, we're basically just going to be adding a cube to it. Uh, and we're going to try and do something to that cube. So um, what we need to add that cube is something called a box geometry, which is just something that contains faces and vertices and what those coordinates will be. Then we have something called the material, which is um, there's a couple of different materials you can choose from um, that 3GS comes with. Uh, so here we have mesh basic material, and this is the one I use the most. Uh, and the color is just a hex color code, and you just add a zero and an X at the front. That's all it is. So does anyone know what this color would be? Green. green, yeah. So we're just adding a green cube. And so all that material stands for is we, we, want, we want greenness, is basically all that's saying. And so then we take that and uh, we apply the box ge geometry and our mesh basic material, put that into our, our mesh, and then that combines those two things and it knows what we're trying to do with them and just puts them together. So now we have a green cube. Super fun. Um, and then uh, another thing to note is that when we call scene.add with no other stuff, um, it's just going to add the object to like the basic like 0, 0, 0 coordinate. So if you start adding a bunch of objects to your scene and you don't actually specify where you want them to be uh, in your world, um, they're all just going to kind of be inside of each other and it's going to look really weird. So um, I catch you off guard. And then finally, um, yeah, finally we have rendering. Um, so you're not actually going to be able to see anything on your screen if you were to like take all that code that I just put up there and you threw it up into the HTML document and then you tried to open it in Chrome or something. You won't see anything because they're not rendering anything. So um, basically all that means is we're trying to create an animation loop. Um, <laughs> so basically what that means is every, we, we're, we're trying to run a loop and every iteration is what we're going to think of as being a frame. So every frame we can check whether the user has clicked something, whether they're hitting the up arrow or down arrow, um, and we can kind of check in with those things. Um, so this is the part that can really confuse people sometimes if they don't really understand what, what the point of rendering is, but this is basically where all the magic happens, hence why I've, why I've added this raccoon. Um, so if I were to pop over to my um, example, I don't think this is going to show. Hold on. <laughs> Come back, PowerPoint. OK, so I'm just going to close out of here. Is this going to show my thing? OK, here we go. Cool. So he, this is actually what we have so far on, um, our, with our script. It's just a box that does nothing, and our world is very dim. Can you make the box a little bigger? Yeah, I sure can. How's that? Yeah, so it's going to look a little bit strange here. There we go. So yeah, it's just a, a, a very black, dark universe, and it's got a single cube in it. Um, it doesn't do anything. And that's mostly because we're not telling it to do anything with, with this cube yet. Um, so start, please. There we go. <laughs> so. Um, we actually have to give it some directions of what to do every single frame. So when we add our cube to the scene, it's got coordinates, and it's got an, uh, a rotation uh, automatically added to it. And you can find all the different attributes and properties of your objects just by checking out the documentation or playing around with the console a little bit. But basically, all we know is that our rotation, um, our x rotation is 0, and our y rotation is, is 0. And if you're new to 3D, you should know that there's three different directions. There's your x, y, and z. So definitely get familiar with those so you know what the heck is going on. Um, but basically, we're just telling it, OK, every single time we, we go through a frame, we want to add 0 0.01 units to this number. And this, it's just going to keep spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. And nothing else is going to happen. 
So if we pop back over to our example and I uncomment that code that you might have noticed right here, now it's going to start spinning. Please, there you go. Beautiful. Isn't this amazing? <laughs> wow. All right. Bye. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> so let's pop back over to here. So what, what is possible with 3JS? Because I was talking about some of these cool things you can do with it, um, and I want to show you some examples. So, so one of my favorite examples ever is called Chill the Lion. It's basically, um, if you look at the code, it looks really complicated until you start breaking it down into little pieces, as you do with most code reading and tracing. But basically, it's a, it's a 3D lion that he built within like 3JS. He took, he took individual box geometries, uh, applied different mesh basic um, ma uh, colors to them, uh, or materials, I should say, and then, uh, and then started having fun with the animation and the different interactions you can have with the mouse. So what that looks like, and I have to end my presentation again, oh my goodness. What that looks like is this. So we got this little line, and when I click, he's so happy. So this guy's actually won awards for this, for some of these 3JS animations. They're super fun. And the nice thing, uh, most of you are probably familiar with CodePen, you can actually go and check out how he built this. So he's got a world div, which is probably where his scene is going to live. Uh, he's got instructions, which is like the text down here and credits and stuff, which is boring. Some CSS, whatever. But down here, <laughs> You might notice some um, you know, familiar words like scene, camera, controls, field of view, aspect ratio, near plane, blah, blah, blah. And then he jumps into it. So he's setting up his camera position. Uh, he's got a WebGL render. So you, you might have noticed in my code that I had a different type of render. There's many different types, and you can check them out in the documentation. Uh, he sets his pixel ratio for um, you know, different devices. So I can actually go and view this on my cell phone, and it would look the exact same, which is kind of nice. Uh, he also has a, a event listeners because every single time you resize the screen, you have to appropriately resize your renderer because you might have noticed we were setting them to very specific numbers when we loaded the screen. So we want to make sure that those numbers get adjusted whenever we resize the screen. Uh, and he's got other event listeners for mouse up. So then he's got a method or a function here called handle mouse up uh, or touch end, touch move. So clearly he is looking for people using their, their cell phones and stuff, so let's go find out what he's doing here. So in handle mouse down, he's got is blowing equals true. What does that mean? Uh, I don't know if we'll, find, we'll get to the bottom of this, but basically you get the gist. So you can go through this and actually see like how exactly is he animating this, and all it basically boils down to is really basic grade seven math, just a lot of it. So you're just basically moving faces and vertices around uh, in a world somehow, and it's a lot of fun. Um, then there's another one that's really cool, which is Stemkowski's motion capture example. So I'm just gonna, I don't know if I, <laughs> I'm just gonna copy the link because I don't feel like reopening this again. Um, open hyperlink, hey, there we go. So this is a really cool one. You can see I'm now on the screen again. Uh, so basically, this guy's a, a computer science professor. He's got so many different 3JS um, open source code examples on his website, and um, I'll be, I, I post the, the link in my PowerPoint uh, slides. But um, one of my favorite examples by him is where he takes your webcam and he adds motion detection to it. So you can imagine that there's a lot of possibilities with this, like I could create a piano and play different sounds just by waving my hand around the screen. So in this case, if I hold my hand over here, it turns red, and over here, so yeah, lots of cool stuff going on. And of course, if I wanted to look at how it's actually doing this, um, I could go into my developer tools. Um, so if I inspect this, wow. So you can see there's a lot of stuff going on here that's being controlled by um, 3GS. So you won't really worry about that part. But um, if I go into here, I can see all his different sources and so on and so forth. And you should actually post um, the script in, within the actual HTML document. So this one is by Stemkowski himself, and here's all the different stuff he's doing. So you can take a look um, on your own time. Uh, and then another example, whoopsie daisy, uh, is Paper Planes, which is a really fun one. So this is one of my favorites. 
Um, let's go full screen here. So use your phone to throw and catch paper planes with people around the world. So you're actually supposed to log into this on your phone. And then basically what happens is um, a little piece of paper will appear with your location on it. So obviously you need to have location settings. And then you basically just pretend your phone is an, a paper airplane. And you, and you kind of move it like this. <laughs> <laughs> like this. <laughs> And then what happens is the, it folds up into a little airplane and it like shoots off your phone screen and then it gets sent in here. So then, you can, then you'll actually end up getting a little butterfly net on your, on your phone then after you've sent your envelope. And then you can try and, and catch an envelope, or sorry, not an envelope, you can catch a paper airplane and then when you open it, it'll have some different stamps of all the different locations where people have opened that specific uh, instance of a paper airplane around the world. So it's pretty neat. Um, and so obviously this one uses WebSockets because you need to have some real-time stuff going on. Uh, and they minified their code, so I was really sad I couldn't actually look at it. But this, act, this uh, project actually won uh, quite a few awards a few years ago as well. So lots of really neat stuff going on. So the last thing I want to talk about is drunk voting, which is the project I worked on. So basically what the client wanted uh, was they wanted to show how dangerous it is to vote while intoxicated because of course that is illegal. So that was with the Alberta Hunter Education Instructors Association and I just lovingly call them IKEA. Uh, so like IKEA, but way cooler I'm guessing. Uh, so basically um, I had to create a whole game engine from scratch and I ended up using um, some filters I found online. So this is like a I, I, I looked online, I found an open source like drunkenness GPU filter. It is written in like with a lot of vectors and stuff that I can't even like comprehend. Uh, so let me just see if I can pull up the code because it's pretty, pretty neat stuff. I don't know, it's gonna pop up. Drunk voting, some, yes, here. Okay, so. I wonder if I can find this. So there's like shader pass and stuff, water shader, toxic pass, there we go. So I can actually play around with these different numbers and get different degrees of drunkenness. So there's, there's one, if you go high enough, you can make it so you can't really even make out what's going on in the scene. And then there's other, like I think we found the right balance where if you stare at this long enough, you, get, you, you feel kind of dizzy. Uh, and so what I ended up doing is um, also, I'm just going to close out these tabs so I don't, get, don't confu get confused. So basically what you're trying to do is, is you're trying to drive this boat past these boulders that are just conveniently placed in this lake. And you're trying to get to that little dock that's out in the distance. So if you approach the dock too quickly, you lose. If you hit one of the rocks, you lose. If you hit the land, you lose. And it's really, really hard because I added this thing in the rendering uh, animation loop where every single time you press a button, there's a 50% chance it's going to go the other way. <laughs> so really give you that feeling that you're losing control. So as you can see here, it looks kind of decent. I'm, I was really lucky with how the textures came out for um, the rocks and the way that the water is shaded. It looks really realistic. But with that really ugly boat in the land in the distance, it just looks so bad. So that was sadly because when uh, we tried loading this up in Internet Explorer 10, it just took so long with all the different polygons and vertices that it had to load up because I, I had like, I actually had a sailboat you had to dodge that was moving and stuff. And uh, the, the sailboat was just so high resolution, like just so many different points and faces that it just didn't want to load them at all. So uh, I had to get rid of that. And then I actually had to go into Blender, uh, edit this boat down and just like take an eraser and just wipe out so many vertices. This isn't actually a whole boat, by the way. I just chopped off everything past what you're seeing here. So there's not even a left side of the boat. It's amazing. And then I put a beer bottle there, so it's really, really obvious you are indeed drunk off of one beer, like me on a Saturday. Um, so yeah, uh, there's also noises. So if I were to unmute this, you can kind of hear. Amazing. My first time playing fully. So I'm actually, I'm trying to press forward. OK, it's working. So I'm go trying to go left. Oh no. Okay. So playing this long enough, it, it actually kind of threw some people off at work. Um, and I, of course, as you hold down the, the up button, um, it's going to continue accelerating. Uh, the, 
I try to put the dock relatively far away so you might mistakenly press it for too long because I've let go now and I'm still mov moving forward, whereas I have to start tapping the back button and now I might accidentally speed up. Oh no, <laughs> you, we're going too fast, try again. So, um, and I hate that noise, oh my god. Uh, so I've also noticed here, uh, I've also placed here a help button in case you have problems using this on um, your device or you don't know what's going on while you're in this world. Uh, if you click this, and I've got some more instructions that pop up on the screen, this is a separate HTML element that is completely separate from what I'm doing with 3 um, However, uh, what's really neat is I added mobile controls. So when I actually go into my device, and of course I didn't do the resizing stuff I was talking about earlier because I totally don't listen to my own advice. Oh, shoot, uh, hold on. Need to re-render this again. Okay, so start, okay. So now, these are also HTML elements, and when I click on them, or if I were to use a touch device, whoopsie daisy, if I were to use a touch device, then uh, these would react appropriately, and so there's event listeners within my 3GS code listening for these key presses. Oh no, I hit the, the rock. Um, but yeah, so you, you don't have to, think too fancy about like, oh, I need to put spheres in my world so that people can press on them. Like, it's really not necessary. Um, there's also, um, of course, collision detection, which is a whole scary and messy world by itself. Uh, I ended up using a library called Physijs, or Physijs, I don't know. Uh, there's no dot in it. Uh, but basically, uh, that also ended up um, causing me some issues in Internet Explorer 10 because um, there's something called like rays so you're trying to calculate, um, or your computer's trying to calculate, um, okay, what is the distance between me and this other place? So it sends a ray in that direction and tries to detect, okay, is this ray hitting something? And is it within the distance that is being specified? No, okay, we can keep going. And then when it hits something, then it might stop. So I wanted it to be like, if you hit the land, you, do, you stop, you don't keep going, no matter how much you keep pressing your keys. And sadly, um, all I could really do is just check every single frame. Am I touching land? Am I touching land? Am I touching land? Uh, and if I was, then I would stop and I will give an alert saying that I've hit the land. But um, it was really annoying when I was testing this because sometimes I would like go straight through the plane and just kind of keep sailing around underneath of the actual land, which is really fun. Um, and one of the other neat things that I did with this project was I took open source uh, to topography maps um, so I took actual coordinates from Pigeon Lake, and I took those, put them on a plane in Blender, exported it as a 3D object, then used a Python open source file to convert that into something that is readable by 3JS, and I actually put Pigeon Lake as the actual setting for this, and then that ended up having too many faces and vertices again. So I ended up throwing that out, and I was really sad. <laughs> but, uh, and then I ended up just going in Blender and just like punching down some squares and stuff, which is why we have this beautiful landscape in front of us. So yeah, uh, so I had a lot of fun with this project. And of course, one more thing I should add is uh, the sun. I have added a sun to this, which you can't really see because it's directly above us. I decided that it would be noon while we're drinking because it's five o'clock somewhere. Uh, and there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with the sun because you can affect how much of a haze there is, what kind of colors there are. Is it, you know, like a, is it farming season? Is there a lot of particles in the air? Should we make it redder? Is it sunset, sunrise? Uh, all those sorts of things. So I actually spent like, I spent like a day just playing around with the sun. <laughs> so yeah, um, so one of the things I wanted to add before finishing this up is there is a lot of reverse engineering you're gonna have to do at the beginning, but the wonderful thing is, is that there are so many open source projects and so many really amazing projects that people have published that you can just go and tinker with the code, especially on CodePen. Uh, so you can just play around with the numbers a bit. Like if I pop over back to um, CodePen, where I was a moment ago, um, let's just like maybe pop over here. Nope. So if I go over here, I can just start playing with the numbers. So what happens if I change this to being three? What the heck? Uh, what if I made this color something different? So uh, I like 0099FF. Now it's a beautiful teal. What if I played around with this and made it 20? Wow. And so then you can also start playing around with this actual position and stuff. So I totally recommend you guys 
taking like an hour this weekend, just check out 3JS and just play around and see what you can do in that hour because I promise you it's going to be so much fun. So um, yeah, with that, I think I'll wrap up my presentation. And if you have any questions at all, I'd be more than happy to answer them for you in a second once this loads. There. All right. <laughs> we had a question up at the front. One of the quick questions is the boat being online. Uh, you would have to purchase a transportation safety course that only just got published. <laughs> so uh, unless you're looking at getting your boating license, uh, unfortunately not. But I'm, I'm actually looking at creating something like this project because obviously somebody else owns it now. Uh, but creating a project like this that people can play around with online someday. Um, there's also, uh, are you familiar with tip, Timpanus Code Drops? CodeDrops.net, kind of. So they actually have a really cool tutorial called The Aviator, which is that plane thing I was kind of talking about earlier, where you're a plane that's sailing through the clouds and there's a little cylindrical world underneath you. Um, it, it goes step by step on how to create the plane, how to create this little world, and um, shows you how to make these really cool interactions that um, you, you will be super proud to show your friends, because I know I showed everybody when I made that first project. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah? So is there like you can set that. Yeah, um, so uh, you could set it to be 60 frames per second, um, 120, which won't make any difference to a normal human person, but I'm sure aliens will appreciate. Um, or you could do 15 seconds, or, or sorry, 15 seconds, 15 frames a second, or one frame a second, whatever you're more comfortable with, it's really up to you. Yeah, any other questions? Cool. Oh, yeah. So the basic framework, they mentioned that it uh, can render canvas yeah. So with the basic kind of framework to that run on a plate that we use, is it you know the same for these other ones that we just kind of use as different tools to try to render it or do you um, I haven't played around with a whole a whole bunch of the other renders. It's mostly with WebGL for this one project, but I um like I, I believe if you if you check out the documentation, I I don't think it's a whole lot different. It's just basically a different way of calculating the math. But I might have to double check on this because uh, it has it's been about a year since I actually played with 3JS, and when I saw you guys are having this meetup, I was like, I have to tell people. <laughs> so, yeah. Anything else? Yes. Um, one of the biggest difficulties I also encountered was just that some things were playing out of date, um, which is, you know, sadly the case with a lot of open source things. Uh, 3JS, the framework itself, is constantly being updated. It's more so like the um, periphery kind of libraries and extensions you might want to add to it. So Physit.js, which I ended up adding to the project, I added it and removed it like three different times because it just wasn't in compatible with what I was trying to do. Um, and some of the math was just breaking. Um, and there's some, like, definitely check out, like, the issues section of the GitHub repo to just check out, okay, what are people crying about? Because <laughs> you don't want to cry about those things, too, um, unless you want to just, you know, figure out how you're going to deal with it or maybe fix it yourself and then contribute to the open source project. But, yeah, um, there is sometimes I was, like, trying to, I was, like, ripping out my hair from, like, stress because I had this due date um, and deadline that I was trying to meet, and I just couldn't get the, these stupid physics to work. <laughs> Uh, so I ended up removing the library and actually just trying to add just some basic stuff like every single frame I'm going to move up by so many units and um, every single frame I'm going to check am, am I touching land? No, then I, um, then I can keep moving forward and if I am touching land I'm going to stop everything and then uh, stop rendering everything, stop playing my sounds and I'm going to show the screen on top of it. So um, I had to get a little bit creative there, unfortunately, because I was really hoping I could just add this library and be good and done. But um, yeah, there, that was one of my biggest limitations, I think, because I ended up actually looking up quaternions. Uh, I didn't go to school for math, <laughs> but uh, I spent like a whole day reading about quaternions just to figure out how am I going to turn my boat. And I ended up re figuring out, oh, I just may maybe need to move up one and then turn one at the same time. So it ended up looking relatively smooth. Um, and I had to actually review my acceleration um, physics and stuff, like uh, how, how do I set acceleration? How do I calculate it? How do I calculate how fast I'm going at a single moment? And um, how do I control how fast my boat is going to go? So that took quite a lot of research. And then um, at the beginning, I thought it was going to be like an overhead view of the boat. 
So I ended up actually uh, trying to look up how do I make those waves behind the boat in a V, and that turns out to be an unsolved mystery. Uh, so I ended up wasting like three days just on that before they're like, no, we just want it to be like you're in the boat. And I was like, cool. <laughs> That's awesome, because now I don't have to do that work. Um, so yeah, um, I think the limitations are really your knowledge, clearly. <laughs> um, but uh, definitely know what you're trying to accomplish, uh, figure out like how you're gonna break down those problems into something that is programmable, like we have to do with most things we program, uh, and then just kind of assess, okay, uh, is this going to hinder um, how well my computer's going to run? Because uh, obviously, you know, back in the old days, when we went from booting up games off of their own drives and stuff to, you know, booting them up within the system, now we're going from that to booting up our, our operating system uh, loading up a browser within that system and then loading up WebGL and running things straight through the GPU through that. So obviously there's a lot of performance things that happen there that kind of, you know, bring things down. Like I could probably do the same exact thing with this drunk boating demo, put it in Unity and just program it a different way and it'll look so much better because I won't have those limitations of Chrome or uh, Internet Explorer and stuff. So um, just something to consider um, in, the, in the future, I guess, is just, it, is 3JS the right thing for your project? Because maybe it's not meant for the web browser. Maybe it's better off in its own separate software program. So that was something that I also struggled with a bit in the beginning, was just like, what am I doing? Am I in over my head? Is this even gonna work? Um, so I ended up having to obviously um, scale back the project a bit um, in order to meet the needs of the client. So yeah, <laughs> anything else? I looked into Greensock quite a bit, um, but I wasn't really sure sure about the licensing with that because um, a lot of the cool effects I liked, um, you know, cost money. <laughs> um, and I also looked into um, another framework. I don't remember the name right off the top of my head, but um, it was way out of date and it looked to do. It was almost like overkill for this project. <laughs> So I, and it, I just didn't feel comfortable when I was looking at the code. I wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to learn that in a fast enough time. Uh, and of course, I did actually approach my boss a few times being like, should we just move this to Unity? Should we just maybe make this into an iframe that somehow, because I know Unity can export for the web. So I was looking into that, but then again, it was like licensing. <laughs> so we didn't want like the Unity thing to show up uh, or like the Unity uh, logo to show up in this project that was for like a professional government organization and stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, so I, I definitely looked at some alternatives, but 3JS in, in this regard was just something that we could, we could get done within a couple of weeks and also uh, you know, easily export it to the client because it's supposed to run in something called SCORM, which is basically just a way of packaging courses that are uh, in a way that you can, you can upload them to any learning management system. So um, we had to make sure that it was like, um, able to be packageable in something small enough that most of these file um, servers for SCORM clients and stuff would be able to handle. So yeah, <laughs> hopefully I haven't rambled too much there. But yeah, um, so I think that's it. Oh. Cool. Thank you so much. <laughs>